We're here in Isaiah chapter 58. I'm going to read the first uh, nine verses, and um, let's pray first before we read, and then we'll get into this chapter today. Let's pray. Lord, it's good to be in your house, and it's good to be able to gather together, and I thank you, Lord, for all those here and those who are watching online, and as we just open up your word today, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts and that we would be open to what you would have to say to us. Lord, so often you, you're speaking to us, but we don't incline our ear, and we don't listen, and we don't do what you tell us, so help us, Lord, that we would be focused and that we would just put aside everything else that clutters our mind right now, and we would just open our hearts to you and to your word and what you would have to say to us. And we're thankful for the opportunity to gather, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse 1. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. And then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And then you will call and the Lord will answer. and You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Well, you may have noticed as we read through this uh, first part of chapter 58, how often the word fast or some form of that word appears here. It appears more times in Isaiah 58 than in any other passage in all of the Bible. Now, the context of Isaiah 58 is a rebuke from the Lord because the Jewish people were fasting improperly. They were fasting as a matter of a religious ritual rather than what they should have been doing is fasting as a matter of seeking the Lord and drawing near to Him. And to make matters worse, not only were they fasting as just a matter of a religious ritual, but while they're fasting, they're also sinning and rebelling against the Lord. That's the first part of this chapter. God says, you know, you're drawing near to me. You're going through all these religious exercises and all these practices, but at the same time, you're sinning against me, you're rebelling against me, and you're ignoring the needs of your fellow countrymen who are suffering from poverty and injustice. And, and he's basically going to say here to them as a matter of a rebuke, if you were really fasting and seeking me in the right way, shouldn't, shouldn't it be evidenced by the way that you're living? But the fact is, you're, you're living in rebellion against me, and your fasts are, are, are only spiritual little exercises, and, and, and they are uh, incomplete and improper. You know, look, the Jewish people basically thought at this time in their history that God would be more impressed by the fact that they were fasting than He would be upset with them for sinning. And how many of you understand that God is never interested in spiritual activity if it doesn't come from a heart of sincerity, right? If, if you're just going through the religious motions and traditions and doing things because somehow you think, well, God will be impressed by this, 
all, all the while you're sinning and you're, and you're rebelling against the Lord. He's not, it's not like balancing the scales. Well, if I just, you know, fast a lot and go to church a lot and, and do this a lot and, and, and tithe, and, get, and then God is going to be more impressed and he'll overlook some of the other stuff in my life that is in rebellion against him. God, God doesn't look at, at things like that. What he wants from us is wholehearted devotion, and, and he's not impressed by the spiritual activity and religious rituals. He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. Now, if out of the overflow of a heart seeking the Lord, we then are people devoted to Him, and as a result, we like to go to church, we like to tithe, we like to fast, we like to pray, then, then okay. But if, if the mindset is, if I do all these things, somehow God will then be impressed and overlook the sin in my life, well, we're just deceiving ourselves. And that's what's happening here. And so God is rebuking them here in chapter 58, and, he, and He's calling them to a proper idea and understanding and practice of fasting, of fasting. Now, fasting is mentioned not just by word, but in terms of examples, 77 times in the Bible. Fasting is mentioned 77 times in the Bible. And in Scripture, there are examples of partial fasts, complete fasts, there are examples of national fasts when kings would call a nation. There are examples of congregational fasts. The Bible does not dictate how long a particular fast should last. There are examples in the Bible of one-day fasts, three-day fasts, seven-day fasts, 21-day fasts, and 40-day fasts. And there are many examples of people who fasted throughout the Bible, and I'm just going to rattle off a few examples uh, for us. Moses. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights while he was receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord, Exodus 34. King David fasted when his son was uh, dying and, uh, and sick. Uh, King Jehoshaphat uh, proclaimed a fast throughout Judah for victory over their enemies in 2 Chronicles 20. The prophet Joel called for a fast to avert the judgment of God. The king of Nineveh, in response to Jonah's preaching, declared a fast throughout the land in Jonah chapter 3. Queen Esther declared a three-day fast for all the Jews prior to risking her own life by, by approaching and speaking with King Xerxes uninvited. That's in Esther chapter 4. In the New Testament, the prophetess Anna, she was there fasting and worshiping, and in her old age, she was always hanging out at the temple, and she uh, proclaimed the birth of Jesus in the temple. She fasted, Luke chapter 2. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4. The early church fasted before sending off Paul on his first missionary journey. Paul fasted before appointing elders in the church, Acts 14, and on and on, many different examples in the Bible of people who regularly at different times and for certain periods of times fasted. And yet, fasting is one of the least practiced and rarely taught of the spiritual disciplines. Fasting is mentioned more times in the Bible than is water baptism, but yet how many of us practice fasting with any regularity? And how often have you heard a sermon on the topic of fasting? Uh, Richard Foster, the author of Celebration of Discipline, said that in his research on fasting, so the Celebration of Discipline is a, is a pretty good book, and he, and he writes on different subjects about the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. And one of the subjects is fasting in his book. And in his research preparing for his book, he found that from 1861 to 1954, almost 100 years, there was not a single publication, paper, book, or anything written on the topic of fasting. From 1861 to 1954, it's, it's, it's an amazing, you know, avoidance of an important subject. John Wesley, an 18th century preacher and evangelist, uh, said, quote, some have exalted religious fasting beyond all Scripture and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. Now, let's ask ourselves this question. Why is it that this subject of fasting is so rarely practiced and even less often taught from the pulpits? And I think the answer is because we have a love affair with food. 
let's just be honest about this. We have a love affair with food, so he, who really wants to practice fasting? And, and, you know, as someone who loves food myself, who really loves to teach about it, right? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Now, you know, thankfully, I, I got my dad's metabolism, so I can eat. I can't quite eat everything like I used to, but, you know, I can still pack it in pretty good and, 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 and still fortunate enough that, you know, my metabolism still, you know, takes care of, of most of it. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll be honest. I love food. I love a good steak. I love snow crab legs, fried chicken, corn on the cob, rolls, butter, ice cream. <laughs> now, don't, don't get me wrong. I like a good salad, too, as a side dish to whatever animal happens to crawl up on my grill. <laughs> But let's be honest, we have a fascination with food, particularly in our culture. We love food, and we plan a lot of things around food. I mean, we, we plan our days around food. We have business meetings around food. We invite family and friends over for food. We have holidays that, that we make sure we have food when we celebrate the holidays. I mean, you know, the, today is kicking off the season for the Redskins. There's going to be food at my house, I guarantee you. I don't, I don't necessarily have to practice this sermon today. <laughs> Come on. But that said, there is still this importance of understanding what fasting is all about. And so since chapter 58 of Isaiah is basically the fasting chapter of the Bible, more references in this chapter than any other part of the Bible. I'm going to use it today as a launch pad for this topic, and I've entitled the sermon, Soul Fattening, the Discipline of Fasting. Now, that's not original to say soul fattening. In fact, that's what the Puritans, the New England Puritans in the 17th century, that's the term that they coined for fasting. They said fasting is soul fattening because when you deny yourself physical food for a limited period of time, and you couple that with drawing near to the Lord and seeking Him and praying, it does something to diminish the cravings of the physical and heighten uh, the, the nourishment of the spiritual. And thus, in practicing fasting, it fattens our soul. It nourishes our soul. And so it, it's a wonderful discipline that the Bible speaks well of uh, not in a mandatory sense, but in, in a sense that there are many benefits to us uh, if we were to practice fasting. There's, there's just something about starving the physical that heightens the spiritual. And in denying the flesh something it craves, it feeds the spirit something it needs. And where we really need to begin with this study, even though I'm, I'm almost halfway through it, is a, a working definition for biblical fasting. So here it is. Biblical fasting is the voluntary abstinence from food for a limited period of time for the purpose of drawing near to God. And let me just share with you a few bullet points as to what it's not. All right, when we talk about biblical fasting, it's not a Christian diet plan, okay? Now, you may in fact lose some weight when, if you fast for a very uh, uh, long period of time, uh, but it's not intended to be, you know, a Christian diet plan. Uh, it's also uh, not supposed to be a, a ritual to show that you are more spiritual. You know, well, I, I fast. Do you fast? Well, no. I, well, I do, you know, and, you know, that kind of a thing, all right? And it's not intended to punish the flesh, all right? It's not, it's not this you know, self-flagellation, like, like, you know, you despise yourself or something, and so I'm just going to fast and, and just really torment my body. That, that's not the purpose of fasting either. And it's not required. It, it's not commanded in the Bible. We are not dictated by God to fast. That said, the Bible does tell us, Jesus specifically, that it is expected and it will be rewarded. That, that, that isn't a contradiction. It's not required, but I'm going to show you in Matthew's gospel where Jesus speaks of it as, as, as basically expecting that we're going to do it anyway. 
So the first place I'll take you, you can just listen or you can turn there is, and I put the references up on the screen for you, Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Now, the background of Matthew 9 is that some of John the Baptist's disciples, they fasted as a regular discipline. The, the, the Jewish Pharisees would also fast as a regular spiritual discipline. And in Matthew chapter 9, some of John the Baptist's disciples seek Jesus out, and they ask him, why don't your disciples fast? Because they noticed that the 12 that Jesus selected don't fast. And so in Matthew 9, they ask him that in verse 14, and Jesus' answer is verse 15. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? Okay, now who's the bridegroom? Jesus, right? Because he, he uses this analogy in Scripture of he's the bridegroom and, and the church is the bride, and that he loves us and he sacrificed for us and he died for us. And, and there's all this marital language also when he talks about how in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will receive you again unto myself that where I am, there you, you might be also. That's all ancient marital language. Because when a couple in ancient times would get married, the first thing that the husband would do is to go build an, a room or an extension onto his father's house so that then he could come back and receive his bride and take her to be with him. And so all of that is marital language. And in the Bible, Jesus is, is portrayed as like the groom and we are like the bride and he loves us and died for us and sacrificed for us. So Jesus says here, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? Then he adds, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Okay, Jesus will die, he will rise again, and then he will send back into heaven. And that's where Jesus is right now, presently at the right hand of the Father. There will come a time when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. And Jesus speaks of it as it's an expected thing. Because when he's not physically in their presence with the disciples, and, and since he's not physically in our presence, because he's now ascended back into heaven, then there is this need that we have to seek him, and, and the way that we seek him is through prayer, but then there can be this added intensity of seeking him through fasting. And Jesus says, when the bridegroom's taken away, then they will fast. He expects it. And he rewards it. If you're in Matthew's gospel, go back a, a few chapters to chapter 6, and verses 16 to 18. Uh, Jesus is speaking about fasting here in this passage, and he, and he begins by saying this, when you fast, notice, not if. There's an assumption that Jesus believes that his followers will at times fast. So he doesn't say if, he says when, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, again, not if, when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face. Now, in, in ancient times, that's just basically, in other words, look, look like you normally do. They would use oil to, you know, as kind of like hair gel kind of a deal, right? And so they would, and they'd make themselves look nice. And so he says, don't, don't disfigure yourself so everybody can figure out that you're fasting. He says, you're doing this unto the Lord. So go ahead and do your regular routine. Put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So in, in Jesus' own words, he communicates, though it's not required, it's not commanded, it's desired, it's expected, and it will be rewarded. Now, let me just throw this in, because I think it's important to say as a medical disclaimer, there are some people who can't fast, particularly people who struggle with diabetes or uh, pregnant women. It's not advisable for some people. And so if in doubt, you need to consult your medical doctor, because, you know, it, again, it's not required, so don't feel like this is obligatory. And so you need to make sure that you are physically able to fast before, before you do this. Uh, but if you are able to fast, there are some benefits to fasting, and I'm going to share just five uh, that, uh, that I see throughout Scripture. Five benefits to fasting. And here's the first one. There's a freeing benefit when we fast. Uh, if you have your Bible still at Isaiah 58, I want to point out verse 6. And if you don't have it there, just listen. Here's what verse 6 says of Isaiah 58. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Colon. And then God is going to explain, here's the type of fast that I've chosen. To loose the chains of injustice 
and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. That's Isaiah 58, 6. And in, in that one verse, you see several different phrases, I think there's four actually, that have to do with this emphasis on being free. Loose the chains, untie the cords, set free the oppressed, break every yoke. You see that in that language there, God is deliberately choosing these words to explain that part of the benefit of fasting is there, there's, there's this freeing aspect. There, there's the breaking of things. There, there's the loosening of something that, that has us bound. And sometimes there are sin strongholds in our lives that take us captive, patterns or addictions, things that, that hold us captive in our flesh that need to be broken. Listen, even Christians need to understand this. When a Christian gets saved, your spirit is regenerated, but your flesh is not. That's why you get a new body. This body is going to eventually die, return to dust. We get a glorified body because the flesh and the appetites of the flesh, though not all appetites are sinful, but the appetites of the flesh, many of which are sinful, uh, will constantly be warring with our spirit that has been regenerated. So within the same person is this conflict, the spirit that wants to please God, the flesh that wants to please self. And your flesh and my flesh always wants to rule, always. Your flesh always wants to dominate your spirit, always. And every Christian needs to understand that the battle is real and the battle will be constant until the day we die and we shed this body of flesh and get a new body and are with the Lord, all right? Then those appetites will all be aligned and because we won't have the struggle of the flesh versus the spirit. Until that day, there are certain sin strongholds that many people struggle with. And I've met with enough people over the years of ministry to know that sometimes the best remedy for breaking addictions or sin strongholds is a period of fasting. There is something that happens in our spirit that is strengthened by the denial of food for a limited time while we seek the Lord. There's this benefit, this freeing aspect of fasting that helps to make our spirit more dominant than our flesh. And that's the key in breaking sin stronghold. It's not that the temptations will go away. Those temptations will always be there as long as you're in a body of flesh. But it is to say, what do we need to do to strengthen our spirit so that our spirit is more dominant than our flesh? Answer, in part, fasting. As we fast at different times and seek the Lord, He strengthens our spirit, it fattens our soul, and we have greater victory over our flesh. Number two, we also see a healing benefit in fasting. Here in Isaiah 58, verse 8, it says, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing, your healing will quickly appear. And then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Now, exactly what kind of healing is Isaiah talking about here? Well, it, it appears that the Lord is saying to the people of, his, of Isaiah's day that if you turn to me, if you seek me through fasting, and you really incline your hearts to me, then I will deliver you from all the calamities that have afflicted you as a nation. It seems in the context that he's speaking more about national healing if they would turn and seek the Lord. But the Hebrew word here for healing actually translates bandages. It's actually a, it's a particular word in the Hebrew that means surgical bandages, long bandages that are used for binding up those who have an injury of some kind. And so I don't know that the word is limited only to national healing. You know, ultimately, listen, God is our healer. And God desires to bring healing, whether it's national healing, or whether it's physical healing, whether it's emotional healing. And sometimes through fasting, we put ourselves in a place where, where we are just more, perhaps more faith-filled uh, because we're seeking Him, or, or we just now have aligned our hearts in such a way that God then moves in, in a more miraculous way in this area. I, I don't know why necessarily, but there's this healing aspect that happens with fasting. And for some of you, you need to be healed of certain emotional things like, like maybe your stronghold is fear, anxieties, um, worry about everything. 
I encourage you to try fasting and see if, if that'll help break that stronghold of fear in your life. Or maybe there is a physical ailment that, that uh, the Lord desires to heal you, and, and fasting facilitates that in some ways uh, because physical healing is a part of it. We see an example in Psalm chapter 35. David is bemoaning to the Lord that his enemies are always at odds with him, always trying to uh, hurt him, intimidate him, uh, and, and all these things. And David says in Psalm 35, he says, you know, Lord, I don't do that to my enemies. He says, in fact, Psalm 35 verse 13, when my enemies were ill, I humbled myself with fasting. On their behalf, he's even praying for his enemies when they are ill. He says he humbles himself with fasting. He seeks the Lord on, their, on behalf of their healing with fasting, Psalm 35, 13. And we also see in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, there's a story many of you are familiar with when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. The other nine disciples are down at the foot of the mountain, and this man comes along who has a son who's demon-possessed. And the man asks the disciples if you could heal my son, and they try and they can't. And Jesus comes down the mountain with the other three disciples, and he sees the commotion. He's like, what's going on here? And, and the dad comes up to Jesus, and he says, I got my son here. He's, he's possessed by a demon. keeps throwing himself in the fire. I asked your disciples uh, if they could heal him, and they could not. You know, I, I imagine that Thomas is standing there going like, yeah, yeah, it's, not, it's never going to work. <laughs> Good old doubting Thomas. Jesus comes along, he's like, oh, how long do I have to put up with this generation? And he heals the boy and delivers him from the demons. And then it says in Mark chapter 9 that his disciples, when Jesus went indoors, they privately asked him, how come we couldn't drive out the demon? And in Mark 9, verse 29, Jesus said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, only New King James and King James adds the word fasting after prayer. It is in the Textus Receptus, which are some of the oldest of the New Testament manuscripts, but not every translation adds the word fasting. But it's interesting that Jesus adds fasting there in addition to prayer. Why? Is, is, are there some physical ailments that we just need a more intense seeking of the Lord for? Perhaps. I, I don't know exactly the reason behind it, but Jesus says fasting coupled with prayer sometimes necessary for some of the more serious of our physical ailments. Number three, there's a strengthening benefit. Now, the temptation of Christ, I think, is a great example of this. Jesus spends 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness of Judea fasting after he was baptized by water, and then it tells us in Luke chapter 4 that on the last day of his feast, he was hung. Uh, uh, sorry, on the last day of his fast, he was hungry, and that's when Satan came to him and tempted him. In Luke 4, verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. He was trying, Satan's trying to capitalize on, on Jesus' hunger. And in Luke 4, verse 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone. And, and so he, Jesus quotes Scripture. Three times Satan tempts him. Three times Jesus responds, with Scripture and resists the temptation. What many fail to realize about that story is that Jesus was not at his weakest when Satan came to him. Jesus was at his strongest. Now, no doubt physically he felt perhaps low energy, he felt tired or weak because he hadn't eaten in 40 days. But those 40 days he spent fasting and praying and seeking his Father strengthened him such that he was in a place of greater resistance to the temptation that Satan brought his way. Jesus was not at his weakest here. Physically speaking, maybe, but spiritually speaking, he was at his strongest, which again makes the spirit more dominant than the flesh. So there's this strengthening benefit in our lives. Number four, there's a helping benefit to fasting. I'll summarize the events of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The Bible says that the perennial enemies of the Israelites were the Ammonites and the Moabites, and they come as a strong force against the southern kingdom of Judah. The king at the time is Jehoshaphat. And when the news reaches Jehoshaphat that these armies are about to wage war against Judah, 
he calls the entire nation to a fast because he's alarmed and he's afraid and he needs help from the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles 20, it tells us further down in the chapter that as the nation is fasting, this one guy named Jehaziel rises up and prophesies. And, and the thing that he says is, uh, many people are familiar with some of the words, they just don't know where it came from. It came from Jehaziel in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when he says, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. So he says, don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And he goes on to talk about how God is going to deliver them from the hand of, of of the enemy. And he says, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. What happened? They were helped. They sought the Lord through prayer and fasting, and they were helped. They were encouraged. Similar thing happens in Ezra chapter 8. There are different times when the people of of God are allowed to return after 70 years of captivity in Babylon back to the promised land of Israel. One of those groups that returns is led by Ezra. And in Ezra chapter 8, he talks about how at at the Ahava Canal, on the way to Israel, they stopped and he declared a fast because he said, I didn't want to ask the king of Persia, who was so gracious to allow us to return to Israel, I didn't want to ask him to send army with us to protect us along the way. He says, because I had gotten through saying to him, our God is going to protect us. So even in my flesh, I feel a little nervous, like on the journey from Babylon back to Israel, we're liable to get attacked and people are going to rob us. But he said, you know what? I don't want to be a hypocrite to the king of Persia. So what instead I did is I called the people to a time of fast. In Hebrews 8.23, so we fast, sorry, Ezra 8.23, and so we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Are you in trouble and you need the Lord's help? Fast. Is your marriage in trouble and you need the Lord's help? Fast. Are your children in trouble and you need the Lord's help? Fast. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, so seek him with prayer and fasting. Last point. There's also a discerning benefit that comes through fasting. In Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and then the list of names. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Paul's first missionary journey began because God spoke through people and they laid hands on Paul and sent him off. But God spoke to people after they had fasted and worshiped fasted and prayed. And then the word of the Lord came, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me for the work I've called them, Barnabas and Saul. Now, how did that happen? Was there a voice in the room? Probably not. It lists here prophets by name. So probably God just put it on the heart of a prophet. The prophet spoke. This is what the Lord wants us to do. But that wisdom and that discernment and that knowledge came because they were seeking the Lord and in part through worship, prayer, and fasting, through fasting. And there are many things in our lives that we need wisdom from above concerning, that we need discernment, that we need help to understand. So many people are always wanting to know, what is the Lord's will for my life? And where should I go? And what should I do? And who should I marry? And what job should I? And all this kind. We're constantly facing one decision after another. And we constantly are in need of wisdom from above. So, What answer, insight, or discernment do you need from God? Fast. What guidance or direction or wisdom do you need from God? Fast. And let me just share a couple of bullet points as we close here about fasting. A few suggestions. Since fasting is not commanded in the Bible, there are no real specific parameters. And so, just by way of suggestions, First, if you're going to fast, because there are no parameters, you have the discretion. 
Do you want it to be a day? Do you want it to be a couple of days? Do you want it to be longer? Uh, I've known a few people in my life, I'm not one of them, who fasted for 40 days. Um, I knew a man whose marriage was in real difficulty and he fasted for 40 days and I would meet with him once a week through the 40-day fast and he would go to his doctor once a week through the 40-day fast too just to make sure uh, everything was okay and it was. But I've known people who have even done 40-day fasts. Um, The Bible doesn't prescribe it, it just gives different examples. So it it could be a full day, a couple days, longer. It could even be part of a day. Um, There have been times in my life at at different times that, for example, I have fasted breakfast and lunch and then I've joined the family for dinner. It doesn't have to, you know, be any longer or shorter than what you want it to be. And and I personally, I know people who, who like to substitute, you know, literal physical fasting for other types of fasting. Like I know people like, I'm going to do a a social media fast. Well, okay, Uh, that might be beneficial in general. Somebody should tell the president that too, but I don't, (laughs) I don't, I don't really, I don't see that biblically. That might just be something that, you know, there are certain idols that rise up in our lives that we need to just kind of put aside from time to time. But I'm not, I'm not one that says, well, you know, I'm not going to do a physical fast. I'm just going to do like a social media fast. Okay, well, that might work for you, but, uh, but strictly speaking, uh, I, don't, I don't really see that in, in Scripture. I would also recommend this. Keep yourself hydrated when you fast. Uh, drink water or, or juice. Some people, when I say drink juice, and be like, that's not a strict fast. It's water only. Uh, some people uh, try to do it without any liquid, and then they die. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you know… Um, now, you do, you do see some examples in the Bible of, of that, and, and those are supernatural uh, sustaining works of God, but by, typically, you need to keep yourself hydrated. Uh, don't be surprised if you get a little grumpy, blood sugar drops, that's why I encourage people, orange juice, try to make it so that, you know, uh, people like you, uh, that, that you're hanging around. And, and I got to be honest, you know, when I, when I first tried fasting, I thought, well, as long as it's liquid, it's good to go. Anything I could get in a blender, man, I put in there. You, you'd be surprised how well jelly donuts go in a blender. And uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do, but keep yourself hydrated, water or juice, um, and couple it with prayer when you can. Because after all, fasting is about drawing near to God. It's not a religious ritual. And be discreet about it. There might be times that you have to actually notify somebody, well, I can't join you for lunch. Well, why? And they keep pressing you. Uh, well, okay, I'm just not eating today. I mean, you don't, but to the best of your ability, keep it discreet. God will see it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, uh, 18. Uh, when you fast, don't make it obvious to people, uh, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who is unseen will see what you do in secret and will reward you. And now that we're all hungry, how about we pray and ask the Lord to grow us in this particular area? How many of you could honestly say, come on, let's just be honest, say, you know, I, I could, I need to stretch myself. I need to grow in this area of, of fasting in my life. I do too. So let's just go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we, we want to seek you and we, we see through scripture the examples, many, of the benefits of fasting. And yet it's not often discussed and it's not often practiced. But thank you, Lord, for setting the example for us and for your word, which encourages us to seek you. And and one way we can seek you on a more intense level is by denying ourselves physical food for a limited time, that we might pray and seek your face and all the many wonderful ways that you will meet us. For some people, Lord, they need answers. Some people, Lord, they need healing. Some people need deliverance from a a sin stronghold. And some people just need your help, Lord. And so may we grow in this area of fasting, that we would seek your face and receive the wonderful benefits that come through this spiritual discipline. But Lord, it won't come naturally to us because naturally we we like food, we want to eat. And so we pray, Lord, that we would take to heart these things from your word and draw near to you. We would seek you, Lord, and that we would exercise this spiritual discipline of fasting.
not because we're commanded, but because you invite us, that you might help us. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you all.